Hi everyone, my name is Adri Van Wantergem with the Penn City Children's Museum and today we are starting off our winter session parent webinar on screens and young children with Belinda from A to Z Tech. So we're super excited to have her here today to present with us. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the torch um, to Belinda and she's gonna let us know kind of what tech and toddlers might look like for us. So go ahead, Belinda. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Adri. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here today. Today, I'll be talking to you about a subject that's very dear to my heart, tech and toddlers. Um, by the end of this session, I hope you'll feel you have a couple of guidelines for your family. Um, so I'm ready to begin. Awesome. A little bit about me before we get started. Um, I am Belinda de la Libertad. I live here in Orange County. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called A to Z Tech Support, LLC. And I'm also the mom in a Pretend City family. And I have volunteered for Pretend City in various ways since about 2010, which was uh, quite some time ago. So I do have two children who have loved Pretend City for years. Uh, my eldest, Angelica, is now 11. My son, Lucas, is six. Both of them began visiting Pretend City as early as age one or just before they turned one. So we are a solid Pretend City family. In addition to that, my work uh, frequently has me dealing with uh, technology matters and evaluating technology hardware, technology software, and looking at how that, um, how technology and parenting and childhood and motherhood and families can come together. So I'm here to give you some tips on that. So let's go ahead and move on to what I call the basics. Okay, in our house, playtime rules. So yes, there are playtime rules, but playtime also rules. And when it comes to playing, especially with the littles, and um, in my conversation today, when I say the littles, I usually mean zero to five. Um, to me, they're the littles. And after that, we're, we'll, we might consider a little bit of the group just beyond that edge, which is early. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at maybe some kinder and first grade related questions. But for today's purpose, I'm mostly focusing on how technology can be helpful or what some guidelines are for that group of children between zero and five. So for this group of children, um, infants, toddlers, and then the just beyond toddler set, their interactions with toys, and now I'm just talking about regular toys, um, are usually in the context of human interactions. So, um, for example, my son loves to play with his cars and his dinosaurs and all sorts of characters alongside his friends or with his sister, or he likes to come and show his parents what he's doing. Um, and infants and toddlers specifically, they are at a developmental stage where they still need to explore, manipulate, and test everything in their environment. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. If you have one at home, they just, they get into everything. And that's just their developmental stage. They're drawn to bright colors, push button switches and controls. So technology is a natural magnet since it has a lot of these things built into it. Um, you know, you can imagine those Fisher Price toys. They're based on that, knowing those details. So let's think about technology for a second. When it is used with a child in this age range, it must be in the context of conversation and interactions with an adult, just like they would use any other toy. It's not something that's a, a solo tool for them. Um, it should be used with, in their case, an adult. Um, for the elders, they might be able to do a little gameplay, elders being the four and five, but for the very littles, we're talking about technology in their play world, with the accompaniment of adult, of an adult. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about what works in this regard. Um, here we have some information that I've pulled together for you, and it may not all apply depending on the age of your child. You can see there in the table, I'll go through it. Let's talk about what is helpful for very young children. So on the very left hand portion of that table there, I'm going to be looking discussing, I'm going to be describing a few different technology-based activities. And across the top row of the same table, you'll see that we've clustered this out for you. And by we, I mean some of my team, because there are mostly parents that work in my company. Uh, we've parsed this out for you by age group. Um, 
the zero to two, the pre-kinder, and then the very early grades. Again, my focus is primarily today those first two groups, but um, our, our kids grow. So in case yours is in, in one of those groups of pre-kinder and you're wondering what happens next, I just thought I'd give you a teaser of what's to come. So when it comes to tech-based activity, you'll notice that under passive screen time, which a lot of us generally recall, generally refer to as watching stuff, the professionals call it passive screen time and we call it watching stuff. That's when you're just looking at the screen. You're not really interacting with it or doing anything active. You're just literally looking like the way adults would watch a show program. Um, for, this, for the youngest children um, in this age group, generally this, is, this activity is not advised. Uh, it's not advised neither alone nor with an adult. And that's something that's come out of the, um, not only the source down there in the National Association of National Association for the Education of Young Children, but also the American Pediatrics Association and several other national childhood, develop, childhood development uh, resources. So we wanna to try to minimize the amount of time that children are spent doing anything passive. The next item, story time with an adult mediator that's listening and reading the content. Um, uh, reading being the adult doing the reading. So not, not very different from reading a storybook with your child. I'm sure a lot of us have heard the advice that reading to your child every day is very helpful. Well, that can also happen with um, on, your, on your device. You can find eBooks or other interactive uh, apps that are storytelling apps that might prompt the child in that traditional Dora style, such as like, where is the tree or where is the mountain? things that give the children the opportunity to point and engage with you so that you confirm or verify for them that they got it right or, or, the, or the device will. Next item, pictures of family, friends, animals, and objects. Now to many adults, this seems like a very simple way to engage with a device, but for children, it is a wonderful way to engage, especially accompanied by an adult because it lends itself naturally to boosting conversation. It also is a great way to expand their vocabulary and to strengthen their uh, recognition and connection to members of your family who may not be nearby. And that's especially true right now during these times where so many of us are, are distanced from our families. So rather than um, just maybe hearing a voice on the phone, if they talk to grandparents that way, you know, there's the visual that can happen on a, something like this, like a Zoom meeting, or you can review pictures with them when they want to feel closer to grandparents and maybe the grandparents aren't available. Maybe you can go through different zoo animals. Um, I know a lot of schools do themes and, and children's programs do themes throughout the month or the year. Pretend City has a lot of themes they do. I believe they change themes every um, few months. So this gives you the opportunity to review new things, introduce pictures of new things into the child's world and really get that vocabulary going. Um, I recall when my daughter was uh, around three years old, she, that was when her love for animals really started to kick in and she wanted to know the name of every single animal. And I was able to find an app that not only had uh, pictures of animals that we could slide through and talk about, but as we slid to the new is the new picture, the sound that the animal made was also played by the app. So she became familiar with what sounds those animals make. She knew what they look like. We would talk about where the animals from because it would, there would be a label on the screen. And um, to this day, she is still very intrigued by animals from all around the world. So that's something that that can be very helpful for your children. Again, for those different age groups, you'll see that it's limited. Then, and by limited um, for that zero to two group, that means under 30 minutes, under 30 minutes per day. For the pre-kinder, the uh, range is more of up to an hour, maybe an hour and a half per day. Those are the, the suggested limits. Always supervised as they are still very young and need that parental guidance. Um, the next category is a special category uh, with a little bit more, um, a little bit more flexibility as far as the time limits go, but still supervised. And those are assistive technologies for children with special needs. Um, there are, have been many advances in this area for families to support parents 
in helping their children, whether it's with communication, uh, and often at this age, it's largely with communication, being able to communicate to you or to interact with the world um, outside of your family by leveraging technology. In this case, um, the, the time limits, the daily time limits are not as strict because this, this is a situation where technology can, can really support the child being connected to our world um, at all. And in, in that regard, we don't want to uh, we don't want to deny the child that accessibility, but we still do want to be involved. Now, I, I know you hear me saying be involved, be present, accompany um, over and over. And I should just describe as well the flip side of what that looks like. So you know what I'm saying. In other words, what we don't want is uh, and what's not recommended really is for the child to be um, to take possession of the device and simply walk away and be alone, either in another room or in an area completely unsupervised, and just be engaging in passive screen time. And that is not the most beneficial for the child. And in fact, I'll, I'll, in the next slide, we'll, we'll get into more detail about that. Um, last but not least, or no, I still have two more here. Video recording. I think video recording has really um, taken off as something that you can do collaboratively with your child with technology that allows them and builds allows them to build their storytelling capability if there's one thing children love to do is tell you a story they love to tell you a story and when my son for example realized that his little pretend digital camera could also take uh, tiny clips, I think they're 10 to 15 second clips, he started literally staging his own tiny movies using his toys as props. He'll create a scene, he uh, imagines a whole scenario, and then he records the movie and he'll come and show me, you know, he'll uh, come and show me the results. We'll watch it together and talk about what, you know, what we think about it. And it's really been fun. He's, it's really sparked that that creative side of him um, that he, he this was before he learned to read so that was really good because he was able to engage in storytelling without being limited by literacy literacy skills yet um, his older sister was already writing stories so he really wanted to produce stories too he just couldn't read and write yet so this was another way for him to do that and last but not least digital artwork offline um, digital artwork is the creation of say drawings uh, paintings using touch-based technology where fingers are used instead of actual crayons or uh, markers. So while technology is, some technology is really good at that, um, for your very youngest children, this is not recommended only because they are still gathering information about the world um, uh, and, and learning that uh, fine motor skills, practicing fine motor skills, and needing to develop those, those little tiny muscles and those little tiny fingers uh, for gripping. So when we adults are using our test screens, we've already mastered all those things. We've already used markers or pencils or crayons for years. And so for us doing the touch over and over, does it take away from our ability to hold a, a marker? But if you've never held a marker in your life and you're doing a lot of touching, it doesn't give you that, that practice, it doesn't build that strength to help you get to those um, higher level developmental skills. So for the very smallest, uh, very youngest children uh, among us, the artwork online or offline rather, the techno technologically driven art projects are not yet advised. But as they um, gain more of that dexterity and children have developed more of that uh, fine motor skill, then it's okay to start introducing this uh, activity to your child because they'll know the difference. They'll, they'll have learned you know, more gripping by the time they're say three years old than when they are one year old. And you can feel more comfortable about them inter intermingling that with swiping, which is the mostly the, the movement used on a, a touch a touch screen interface, a touch screen device. Okay, and could we go and see that next? Uh, I think there was one more point on here. 
Oh, so my takeaway, the biggest takeaway that I would like for every family to have from this um, really meaty table is that children at this age require supervision when using technology. Now, I know you're busy moms and dads. We're busy, a busy mom and dad here in our home. And it's so very tempting to, um, and we're also tired. <laughs> it's very tempting to provide our children with a device and just have them uh, be entertained for a little bit while we catch up on some work or get a break in. And, and I can understand that. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that I have an older child along with a younger child uh, who get along very well together because sometimes my older child loves to read to my younger child. So while she's not the adult, I will allow them to use a device together. So that might be, if you have more than one child, that might be another way to continue to make it interactive is try and uh, introduce an activity they can do together. Guessing games are really great for this. Um, other, when, when you do get to the point where they're doing the digital art, there are ways they can collaborate and work on it together as well. So uh, together is better than alone. And with mom or dad is ideal if you can achieve that. With mom or dad is ideal, but if, if, you, cannot, if you cannot achieve that, then children together is better than a child alone. Oh, uh, this is a, one I get asked about a lot, which is gaming. So unsupervised gaming or content creation is not recommended. <clears throat> uh, for unsupervised gaming, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of information on that in, in the news media, in parenting magazines. Um, one of the, the risks of that and, and has been shared widely with parents in America is that in those online gaming worlds, uh, your children can be exposed to adults without your permission. Um, there can be adults who are posing as other children in the gaming world um, who are there specifically targeting children. And it's not always possible to discern whether you are engaging with an actual child or an adult posing as a child. So for that reason, unsupervised gaming for very small children is not recommended. Now on the content creation, this one is a little bit trickier and a, a little bit harder to understand, but as someone who's worked in this world for quite some time and who worked in uh, communication and technology policy, um, I feel it's my duty to inform any parents who talk to me and ask me questions about these topics that there are different laws that apply to different pieces of technology. Unfortunately, this is not printed on the box when you buy it. So unless you're someone like me, who's really uh, into the nerdy parts of all this, you may not realize that. So I feel it's one of my duties to share this information with parents. So for example, if your child is taking pictures on a device that's connected to the internet, that device is going to fall under um, the scrutiny and jurisdiction of an agency called the Federal Communications Commission. Any device that is able to transmit a message, either wirelessly or wired, has to follow laws that are set by the Federal Communications Commission. Those laws absolutely restrict and um, prohibit the transmission of images, of very certain and specific images of children um, that fall into the child pornography category. Now, as parents, we would not assume or think that we would ever make such a thing. We would not imagine our children doing such a thing. But if you've ever walked on and in on your child who's gotten a hold of your phone or your camera and they're taking pictures of anything they like, and that might include themselves before bath time or their brother and sister right before bath time, you might think that's innocent fun. I might think so too, but the Federal Communications Commission would not. And if that picture is sent over the wireless or uh, through your cable internet surface to another person, say grandma or an aunt, then technically, and as far as the Federal Communications cons Commission is concerned, you have broken a law. Your child has broken the law and you will be held liable for that. So 
until the person is able to be responsible for what they're sending and receiving, I don't recommend ever allowing children to be unsupervised with a device that is connected to the internet or cellular service. On the other hand, if you get them a device that allows them to capture content and it cannot be transmitted, that you get a little more leeway there. That thing is just a toy. It's not governed by the same laws as those I just described. And it's uh, from a parenting perspective, it's much safer. So for, for my son, for example, earlier I referred to a camera where he takes pictures and he records little videos. That is, um, uh, I can't remember if it's Fisher Price or um, uh, Navco, Telco, something co. It's a little blue and green camera. It's completely, uh, it's completely covered in rubber. You know, he can break it. He can stop <laughs> on it. It won't break. But it does not have any wireless capability. Um, it does not have any uh, way to tap it into a computer network. It's a completely offline camera. So everything he does or creates stays in the camera unless I go and add a, you know, one of those little tiny chips and pull it out, which I don't do. And we don't even talk about it. He doesn't even know that's a capability. He just knows it's full. And then he has learned to erase. And he does that over and over. And while for adults, we might find that infuriating, children don't mind. They are perfectly fine with starting over, throwing something away, doing it again. They're not personally tied to all of these memories like we are. So I feel like it's, it's just like a chalkboard as far as he's concerned. It is the 21st century of a chalkboard for a child. <laughs> he does all kinds of things. He wipes it off, starts over. So what doesn't work? This is a much shorter list than what does work, but it's very important. What doesn't work? As I mentioned earlier, alone time with technology. So as, as I hopefully covered thoroughly, it simply does not allow a child to grow and develop those skills um, and thoughts that they need to. So interaction is best. What also doesn't work for this age group are keyboards and mice. I do at times see children trying to put the, um, I'm sorry, I see parents, excuse me, trying to put their smaller children on a, on a computer, on a regular computer for grownups. And they really haven't mastered that because again of the fine motor skills. Also their hands, their little hands are not sized in the same proportion that matches a keyboard. So expecting them to reach for the keys is very challenging. Uh, it's a very challenging activity for them. It's easy for us, but it's hard for them. Uh, not to mention, if you think about their, if they're learning the alphabet and it goes from A to Z, but then you put them at a keyboard, it looks like alphabet soup, literally. And there's no context for them as to why it's not A to Z. So in my family, we skip keyboards altogether until, uh, I don't think my daughter got on a keyboard until she was 10. Okay, next one. The unsupervised online time. Um, I think I just covered those and I won't, I won't bother going to, into that bullet again, but uh, you're welcome to obtain a copy of this at some point. Uh, smartphone screens. This one is the kicker. This one is really hard. I know it's really hard as a mom. It's really hard as a dad. Uh, your child, especially if you're out of public and you need your child to be quiet for a few minutes and you just want to hand them your phone. Okay, a couple minutes, maybe not too bad. But technically speaking, because their little eyes and their vision is still developing, um, the constraining of our vision, our line of sight to this, this little tiny screen that's right in front of our face, uh, for grownups, it's no big deal. But for children, uh, it is preventing them from doing the far seeing that they need to develop their depth perception or their 3D perception. Um, people can uh, human beings can understand the space that they're in because their eyes have had such a long time to practice seeing something near and seeing something far. And the more we put these tiny little screens in front of tiny little faces and eyes, the less practice they get to do that. Um, not only is it close to your eyes, but the width of a screen is very, very narrow. So it's just kind of like, you know, like almost like a horse with blinders. Um, and we want to make sure that when they grow up and as they're growing up, their, their, their eyes are developing in a way that allows them to perceive depth correctly. You know, this is very important for driving. Uh, it's very important for athletics. It's very important for all types of things we do in life. So I recommend 
uh, if you are going to use a screen, try to avoid the, the small smartphones and start with something no smaller than, and I'm, I'm actually going to save it because I think it's on the next screen, which is which devices are best. No smaller than this. I think everyone by now, most people by now have seen one of these devices. This is the iPad. Um, amongst all the devices out there for engaging with a young child technologically, the iPad has been designated as the top choice. And there are many reasons for it. Um, not only because it looks cool, but it's smooth. There are not <clears throat> obtrusive buttons. The touch screen is very easy to understand for both adults and children. It's easy to engage with your child. It has the built-in camera. There's no having to jump from one device to the other. Um, for example, right now I'm sitting in front of a traditional desktop computer that has a separate webcam attached to it on top of an integrated webcam, <laughs> plus a mouse, plus a wireless keyboard. There are a lot of parts. The iPad has one part. For a child, that's very easy to manage compared to a machine that has a lot of moving parts. Um, additionally, uh, it is uh, accessible to those smallest children who still have limited dexterity, right? They can just maybe like point with one finger, maybe, but a lot of times they're still palming things, right? So the iPad makes it easier for that. You could even design a screen where you have the icons far away from each other to accommodate that whole little palm instead of just the <laughs> one finger. Uh, they're also very lightweight. And I can't remember that last bullet after lightweight. Oh, there's no keyboard. Great top choice. Now, I know iPads can get expensive. So what if you don't have an iPad? What can you do instead? If, uh, if an iPad is out of your price range right now, you could also try um, working with your child on a touchscreen computer. Um, touchscreen is the next, a touchscreen PC is the next best choice. It gives that same kind of touch and feel experience of the iPad. The keyboard is not necessarily required. Um, one thing I do like about the touch screens compared to the iPad is that you get more screen space. You get a bigger screen space. So uh, this example here, this is actually a 15 inch diagonal, which is a pretty good size. And you can get, um, you know, if you want to go all out, you can just get a whole touch screen giant TV, which is, it looks kind of weird, but just think of it as a monster iPad. Um, <laughs> so those, and I saw a sale recently where I can't remember what store it was. Um, had them at a, they were there, it was a clearance and they were at 425, I think it was 399 to 425. And I thought, why am I using computers? I'll just get one of these. Because <laughs> the smart TVs and now have all the apps built in. But the more range you can give your child to exercise those little eyes and uh, the ability for them to touch things, the better. I actually like when it's a big screen and stretched out because then when my children reach for things, they're still moving their arms around as opposed to keeping their arms really close to their body, kind of tight the way we do when we're using our phones. So um, I really like that. Um, so this example here just supports vision better. What about apps? What are the right apps? Well, there are thousands of apps. So I don't have a short list for you of the perfect app. But what I will say is that when you're choosing an app, I would lean towards the ones that really are designed to include the parent, to include the parent and give you that, uh, that child and me and give the child the parent and me time that, that they really need, that they would be having if you were reading a book or playing a game with a ball outside. Um, apps that can be downloaded and play offline are ideal for many of those reasons I mentioned earlier, which is that they don't expose your child to adults without your approval. And another thing to think about is whether the app has the ability to set a time limit, to automatically set a time limit when you, when you install it, um, or to require parent approval. Um, starting these limits and setting these limits early on in this exposure makes it a lot easier to to keep them as your child grows. And as your child ages, they can, um, they, you can work with them to extend their privileges as they age. Whereas if you start with no limits at all, and then you try to insert a limit once they're six, seven or eight years old, um, it, it's, go, it's much more challenging. It's much more challenging. I've, I've heard of numerous, numerous um, stories, uh, really horror stories of parents who learned the hard way 
how challenging it is to, to implement a stop time for their children on their devices. So I just recommend from the get-go, right out the gate, if you're going to use devices, lean towards things that allow you to, to control and set those limits. Uh, next slide, please. A couple of gentle reminders here. Um, technology is no substitute for traditional 3D toys. It can be an addition to your child's collection of, of things they can interact with, but um, hopefully uh, you will see that there still is a lot of value in traditional toys, especially with the manipulation and the uh, development of dexterity. Um, it's also no substitute or, or nor sitter for parents. Um, sure, it's interesting, but children just really, really benefit from that that intimate time with mom or dad, um, there's no substitute for it. So you don't always have to get on the device with them. It's okay to even go through the exercise of putting it away with them and doing something else. So they get used to that routine of, okay, we're done with this. Bye-bye, it goes bye-bye and on to the next thing. Uh, technology for ages zero to five works best when it's used as an engaging playtime activity with a caring adult. And I just, I just, I love to repeat that. Because that's something that as adults who did not, uh, for many of us adults who did not have these things when we were children, it's easy for us to forget that. It's really important to remember. And uh, as I also said, tech limits from the start make it easier to hold to as your children grow. So those are the most, uh, those are the things that I hope you remember. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing those tips. Um, oh, you're welcome. We did have, <laughs> we did have a few um parent questions that we've received on this topic in the past. Um, so I wanted to get your expertise on them. So the first one that we have is how can we use technology as a tool with our young learners um, rather than a source of entertainment, but how could we use it to maybe encourage learning and the learning process? Um, that's a great question. And since we're talking about such a young group, one of the things that I had mentioned earlier was vocabulary. Um, so to me, that's the, that's the natural go-to for this, this very young group because they are learning so many words. Um, in addition to vocabulary, uh, I mentioned animals, which is another thing, which is another way of expanding vocabulary. And also you can expose them to different kinds of environments like, uh, like uh, geographies. Now here in California, we're very fortunate that we can see, on some days we can literally see the beach and the mountains at the same time, but, um, but not every child has that uh, privilege, has that ability or, or that is, is so lucky. So uh, it's really interesting to me when I show my children pictures of faraway places, mm -hmm. it starts really sparking their imagination. Um, for example, you know, uh, the Sahara, we, we mm, love to look yeah. at pictures of animals in their natural state. Um, different uh, waterfalls. Uh, they haven't been to a waterfall up close. So, you know, pictures of Niagara Falls, just things that make their little mind go, wow, such mm -hmm. a place exists? I can't believe it. And uh, of course, fairy forests all around the world. So I think that is another way to use technology is simply a window to the world that builds mm -hmm. their vocabulary. Awesome. Yeah, definitely encouraging that exploration of new topics, you know, using all those resources that we have available to us um, because we are so in interconnected. Um, so I love that. And it's another... it language neutral. I forgot to mention that's another thing. Yes, yes. It's language yes. neutral. Looking at pictures is a language neutral activity. So you can teach that child vocabulary, not just in English, but if your family speaks another language at home. Uh, my, my children speak Spanish and English. So uh, we do sometimes at home where uh, Sundays are all Spanish. And mm. so even though we're playing and, and you're used to the games we've done, we're now doing them in a totally different language. You can do that same thing with your child. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's so many apps and tools now that it can encourage that bilingual immersion. Um, so that's awesome to hear that you're doing that with your kiddos. Um, another question that we received is, what are some ways that my child and I can engage in screen time together where it's still kind of playing with purpose and that we're, we're engaging with one another together? Um, so you mentioned, 
you know, exploring pictures of faraway places. Um, you also mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, you know, recording play scenarios that your son sets up. Um, but do you have any other other ways that you can engage um, with tech um, and your toddler? Yeah, for some for some of the 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 older of the littles, like the three to five, um, I've seen games that are more active that parents can do with their child. Uh, if you think about uh, like the Simon Says type game, but with uh, music and a faster paced activity, it's a way for children to get some exercise and there's no reason why the parent can't join them. Um, it also gives the parents a movement and it helps your child see that, that as a parent, you value activity too. Mm -hmm. And you know you think it's fun, and if you think it's fun and you do it with them, then hopefully you view that in them early, and they continue it as they grow. Um, to me, that's been one of the fun ones. There was a there was a game I saw that uh, with the right device, it's it's kind of like a Wii setup, mm -hmm. but it will uh, project the equivalent of say a soccer field or um, some other some other sports fields on yeah. your, on your floor. And you can literally like run around and it, it oh, captures amazing. your movement. So um, you can hear sound effects like goal or score. And you know, it's really <laughs> fun things that uh, my son finds very exciting. And we have to do them together. We have to do them together because even if we were doing them in, you know, outdoors together somewhere, we'd still be doing it together. Um, I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, uh, underscore also the value of that storytelling, that joint storytelling with the video. Mm -hmm. One thing, as parents, we're very used to taking video of our children. Yeah. But yeah. if you turn it around and you let them take video <laughs> of you, they just, it, they just love that. Um, it does a couple of different things. Not only does it give them a little creative license, but it, lets them see it gives them sort of that opportunity to be a director of sorts mm -hmm. and there's nothing uh funnier than a child trying to direct their parent <laughs> and you know asking i mean, they'll ask me to be silly they'll ask me to make us you know make a sad face make a bad face make a, you know and and i'm trying to follow their direction and they just the giggle fits that we end up having you know especially if i'm not doing it in the way that they're imagining it, um, it's hilarious. And it's just such fun memories. And just those storytelling capabilities, just, I mean, off the charts, fun. They're mixing and matching characters from different periods in history, or, you know, like dinosaurs with robots. And, you know, I know like in, in grown up world, we wouldn't do that, but they do it and it's awesome. It's like dinosaur train, but in my living room. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, just capturing their imagination and just and using, you know, technology together um, already sets the tone that it's something that can be used for creativity and that you can share it with others. Um, right. And, and, and when they also are a little bit older and you get to the, uh, <clears throat> or I mentioned the, the digital art creation, mm -hmm. that can be done as a joint project very easily. With mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And the last question I have for you, and this, you know, this comes about in this time of pandemic and we're, we're shifting the way that we're approaching education as a whole, um, what recommendations might you have for parents that are worried about balancing screen time with the introduction of distance learning in their home? Um, oh. We're finding, you know, kids are spending a lot more time in front of the screen nowadays. So what is something that you might recommend to a parent that's worried about that? That's a great question. Um, this <clears throat> this new scenario or this recent scenario of distance learning has really um, impacted so many families and, and thrown so many of us for a curveball um, in in trying to balance it, as your mm -hmm. as your question states. Um, prior to school closing for our children back in the spring, um, we had very minimal screen time for our children. But then my daughter at age uh, ten at the time immediately had to go to distance learning and was now in front of a screen for a good part of the day. <clears throat> so what we did to support her and to support our teacher is we instituted a, a, a schedule of breaks. She had to take a break. 
Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the teacher agreed, our teacher agreed that all the children needed a break. So um, it was the teacher's guidance of letting us know like when, when were the opportunities, when were the best opportunities for breaks uh, between different modules. Now, if you recall, uh, for those of you who your children may have grown up to be a little bit older now, but um, children have a very, very short attention span. So while as an adult, it might sound maddening to only have a meeting for five to 10 minutes and then be asked to get off and go do something else and then come back to something later. For a child, it's very natural. Um, mm -hmm. It's very natural to spend just a few minutes on something and then walk away from it. And it does not, for them, that's normal. So the adult brain kind of has to renormalize or, uh, or recalibrate rather what a child considers normal, which is very different from what an adult considers normal. At the very beginning for my son who was in, uh, he was in pre-K at that time back in spring 2020, um, we had never put him nor any of his uh, peers from school on a Zoom, you know, on a Zoom call. And when we did, no one knew what to expect, like for many parents around the country. Uh, and what we discovered was that we had to let go of our expectations. Mm -hmm. we, we could not expect them to just sit there like they were little tiny adults in a meeting. The kids did not use the Zoom engagement in any way that looked like adults would. You know, some of them mm -hmm. played in front of the screen with each other. Some of them kind of just looked into the camera, like literally like, you know, put their face around the camera <laughs> and then pulled back and then lost interest. And my mm -hmm. son would literally get up and walk away and be playing kind of a, they call it parallel play. I think parallel mm -hmm. play, is that still a term? Where kids are playing near each other, but not necessarily with each other. And he would basically go parallel play with the tablet so he could hear his peers <laughs> nearby. Like he knew he was in an environment where his friends were connected, but he wasn't really engaging with them. And then when he was ready to come back and engage with them, he just came back to the thing and sat down and you know, they were all doing it the same way. At first, when my husband and I had our adult hats on, we we're like, that's not right. He needs to be in front of the screen. But then we realized, wait a minute. No, he doesn't because he's just doing exactly what he would be doing at pre-K. And we, mm -hmm. we flexed on that. And all the parents agreed, let's just be flexible. Let's support each other. And let's make sure these kids get away from the screen when their bodies tell them they need to get away from it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, if, and, if, and if your child is at a point where they're kind of uh, maybe not, they're, they're, their need to get away from it is not getting triggered, then it's okay to go ahead and intervene. Say, okay, it's time for a walk. It's time mm -hmm. for, you know, let's go kick the ball outside or whatever it's time to do that gets them away from the screen for, you know, mm -hmm. give their eyes a rest and give them that far, that, that far sight stretching of their of their vision um i love walks for that reason we're always looking at you know like i said off to the mountains <laughs> on the mountaintops yeah. can we count today yeah yeah just taking those breaks to you know remove yourself from such a small world on the screen and then going and experiencing you know the world as it is outside of that screen i, I love that and, and and especially if if you have the opportunity if you are near some place that you could get them out to some nature mm -hmm. so that they're not losing connection with the things they would normally be playing with, like rocks, mm -hmm. sticks, trees, grass, mm -hmm. dirt, all of that stuff. I think it's a great um, way to reground them and then bring them back to this virtual world. We don't want them too much in the virtual world because um, those things, other things are important too. They're tactile discoveries. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for fielding some of those questions from our parents. Um, I know we have our, our, your contact information up on this last slide for us here, but if you wanted to briefly just talk about um, some of the other sources that you put on here um, sure. that might be of use to parents. Sure, absolutely. So that first one is that National Association of Education for Young Children. The second is the American uh, Association of Pediatrics. And the third one, Merit Talk. Merit Talk is a, a third party source that writes articles about technology as used or pushed out from government agencies in the realm of public service. So this specific article was doing some research around um, 
screen time for children. Um, initially, the research that they were doing was looking at it in schools, but then the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And now, because at school, kids were not in front of a screen all day long. Mm -hmm. right? Remember, we had them still going, if they were older students, they actually walked from class to class. And if they were younger <laughs> students, computer time was just a, a portion of the day. It wasn't necessarily the whole day. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we did that flip to distance learning, it just changed for so many children. And so, and the researchers then also pivoted. They had to shift as their, well, yeah. Yes, yeah. They, everyone had to shift, so they shifted too. And, and their question became so much more relevant and pressing. So this was a, an article that, that was put out about that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they published. Um, I find their, their articles very interesting because so many times technology gets introduced to us in in realms of public service before we are even knowing that that's going to happen. Um, you know, we and we interact with public uh, agencies a lot without without really thinking about it sometimes as adults like DMV mm -hmm. right? or sometimes you have to go to the Social Security Administration or uh, just recently um, the libraries are starting to reopen. Mm -hmm. And my, my children love the library. We've been a big library family for years. And now under COVID-19, um, there is a whole scanning and temperature check process if you're even allowed to go in the library. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, so, I mean, so much is so much of the world now. It just, <clears throat> just looks so different. Right. Um, and so the deployment of that technology, that decision had to happen somewhere. It's usually at a government mm -hmm. agency. And so that that website kind of keeps me on top of what are all these other points of contact where my children are going to be exposed to technology that I might not even realize. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, those are some great um, resources that you parents can check out. Um, if you have more questions about screens with your child, um, you can also contact Belinda as well. Um, her contact information will be um, attached to this presentation as well. But I just wanted to thank you so much from our Pretend City Hearts, Belinda, for joining us today um, and giving us, you know, some direction on how to manage the screen time with our young learners. It's such a heated topic right now, and I know it's all fresh on our minds because of this pandemic, um, but we appreciate your expertise. Um, and as always, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're so welcome. My kids love Pretend City and uh, my littlest, of course. He can't wait to go back. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Bye.